Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, sponsored by the National Health Association. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and today my special guest, and I'm delighted, is uh, Maxime Seguin, who is a uh, vegan entrepreneur, a, a fitness person, a, a competitive athlete, founder of Fit Vegan Coaching, and he's been working uh, very passionately with this marriage of uh, fitness and plant-based nutrition for many years, helping people transform their lives and health. Welcome, Maxine. I'm excited that you, had, you were able to join us today. Thank you. Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association, the oldest organization in the world, championing the extraordinary benefits of a whole plant food diet and healthy lifestyle, as well as water-only fasting. We believe that health results from healthful living and focus on evidence-based science that promotes the health of you and your loved ones, as well as the health of all animals and the environment. We feature experts from a cross-section of disciplines within the plant nutrition, vegan, psychological, environmental, and animal compassion sectors. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, the NHA's Director of Health Education. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for having me. Very excited to be here and providing some value to the audience. Well, you know, it's uh, you're you're here because of uh, the passion and the drive of a very mutual friend, Robert Cheek, and yes. and Love Robert, Robert and Robert is relentless, as you know. And he said, "You got to have Maxime on," because and I said, "Absolutely, I'd love to do it." So he's uh, he's the go between for us. Yeah, absolutely. I love Robert. He's awesome. He's doing amazing work. And I'm actually going to see him this weekend. There's a, a, a conference, um, Plant Trition Project, I believe. Yes. Yeah, that's great. So I'm going to go connect with him out there. Yeah, I know him for many years, both as a friend and even as a client and a patient for a short while, though. So, Maxine, let's get right into some things. Uh, you know, people love to know when we have guests a little bit of their story. And I know you got into the field of coaching and I know you had even talked about uh, at one little interview that I saw that you had even wished that you had gotten into plant-based nutrition actually even a little bit earlier in your life, if you could have. Talk a little bit about the segue for you, because many people get involved in this in different ways. It could be for animals. It could be for the environment. It could be for nutrition. And I know you had some compromised health in some of your family members, including even uh, an ex-partner who was uh, very close to you. Can you talk a little bit about how you journeyed and segued into you know, where you are now and how you got into this. Yeah, absolutely. Get ready for, for a ride on this story. So, you know, I, I grew up on a farm, kind of like Robert, right? 140 acres. We had chickens, cows, geese, rabbits, I think 15 cats, a bunch of dogs, like a lot of animals. We were the typical redneck family, red pickup truck. We do hay every summer. You know, we go out and grab the fresh eggs in the morning. And so, you know, one day uh, I was training for bodybuilding at the time. So to put on some, some muscle because I grew up really skinny. So I got into bodybuilding. I worked out. I got really big. I competed in bodybuilding. I did powerlifting after that. So I got even bigger and even stronger. I was about 240 pounds. I'm six foot four, just to kind of put it into, into reference. Right. And then one day I'm hanging out with a friend, doing our workout. And then after we're done the gym, he brings me to another friend's apartment. Uh, and when we open the door, there's a runway in the apartment, like a high fashion runway. I was like, what kind of friend do you have here? He's like, well, it's my modeling agent. I'm just here to get some business cards because I have some upcoming shows. And then she looked at me and mind you, I'm 240 pounds, big chubby cheeks, really big. She's like, I see something under those big chubby cheeks. Try losing some weight. We'll do a photo shoot. See if we can get you some jobs. I was like, you know what? I've been doing bodybuilding and powerlifting for so long now. Let me try this thing. So I started doing a little fat loss phase to prep for a photo shoot. Then I did a photo shoot and then I booked a job and I made, I think it was like two, $300 on my first job. I was like, I'm working at Subway at like 12 bucks an hour <laughs> at the time. I was like, this is, you know, two days worth of income for me. And I, someone took photos of me for two hours. I'm like, this is great. I need to do more of this. So I went back to the agent and she's like, if you want to do this, you need to be a lot skinnier. You're still too muscular. You're still too big because you're tall. You have to walk on the runway and you need to fit into the sample size. Mm -hmm. I was like, what's a sample size? She's like, small, medium, like a sh medium shirt. I'm like, I'm an extra large right now. That's a big difference in shirt size. <laughs> right, right. So I went on Google that night and I was Google, how do I get the skinniest and the fastest possible? Vegans showed up, right? I said, vegans are skinny and weak. 
I was like, cool, I don't care if I'm weak. I just need to be skinny. <laughs> so the next day I went vegan. So I substituted my breakfast of, you know, a dozen eggs for breakfast, bowl of oatmeal with some blueberries and peanut butter. And I, I was eating three chicken breasts every two hours for five meals a day at the time. And I did this for many, many years to automatically frozen a bowl of frozen blueberries, dates and banana. That was my first vegan breakfast. That was over nine years ago. And that's kind of like what started that transitional journey was that I needed to get skinny in order to be able to fit in the clothes, which disclaimer, you can be strong and athletic and be vegan. I didn't know that at the time. That's just what I found on Google. Um, and as I transitioned, I felt really good. My nose started clearing up, but I, the cool part was I didn't know that my nose was clogged up because that's how I'd been living my whole life. And all of a sudden it cleared up and I was like, oh my God, I can breathe better. And there was a, a brain fogginess that went away. Again, same thing. I didn't know that I had brain fogginess. I was always told that I had uh, a hard time with uh, deficit with attention, right? I couldn't focus in class. I couldn't study. And then it cleared up and I was like, I'm actually pretty smart. <laughs> I can focus on things. I can work on different projects. And so I felt so good. I just never felt the need to go back ultimately. So that was kind of like the early days of the transition. And then moving on into my life, you know, that was around the time when I transitioned. My grandfather got diagnosed with cancer. Um, he was 63 years young uh, at the time. And he ended up passing away within a few weeks of his diagnosis. And, you, you know, transitioning to veganism, washing forks over knife, having my grandfather pass away, it just connected in my brain. I was like, oh, wow, like I need to help people not be in this position. And so that kind of embarked my journey of wanting to spread the message online. And then fast forward several years, I meet my ex fiance. We start dating within three months, um, you know, go to our hospital, get a call from the doctor. We need you to come in, gets diagnosed with breast cancer. She uh -huh. was, how was she at the time? She was 34 years old at the time. Yeah, she was 34 years old at the time. And um, I loved her. I wanted to be by her side and support her through this. The doctor gave her one year to live. Um, as soon as she got sick, I was like, Hey, you need to like eat whole food plant-based. Like you need to transition. You can't be eating the stuff you were eating before transition to eating whole food plant-based inflammatory markers went down, tumor strong. Everything was getting better. She lived a total of five years, mm -hmm. she had it four years to where the doctor told her that she would live with a pretty good quality of life. Like we traveled, we still lived our life. Obviously there was times where it was a little bit harder. Um, and it was a very challenging time of my life and, and, and her life. Uh, and ultimately, you know, she ended up passing away in February, uh, two and a half years ago, um, almost two and a half years now. But when I was going through this with her and seeing what was on the other side, when someone loses their health, because my grandfather was sick, but I didn't live with him. I wasn't the one caring for him. And now being a caregiver 24 seven for five years, I was like, man, I don't want anyone to have to go through this. And then when you look at the study and you look at the research, if you eat a whole food plant-based diet, if you're moderately active, you prioritize your sleep and you take care of yourself, you're greatly reducing your risk of all these diseases, including cancer. And so that's kind of what embarked me on this journey of coaching, of wanting to help people transition to eating more plant-based, losing the weight and becoming healthier and fitter. So how soon after that did you start the Fit Vegan Coaching? Was it very soon after that? Was that the first thing you did? Uh, so I started it maybe eight months before she passed away. I see. Uh, so right at the beginning of COVID is when I started it because again, working corporate job, everything got shut down. And right. so ultimately I was forced to kind of like stay at home. And I was like, I am willing to work 10 jobs to pay for cancer treatments because it's very expensive. And I was paying right. everything out of pocket, but there was no job. Everything was closed. It was shut down. So ultimately ended up going online and kind of building the business from there. Yeah. We all had to kind of reinvent ourselves. You know, I was working, doing a uh, private retreats in a hotel oh. fasting and health retreats. And then the hotel had to close down. So yeah. all of a sudden we had to just cancel that business. And so the next thing was, you know, what do you do next? And so yeah. it wound up being, you know, a consultation online doing this and, you know, all of this shuck and jive just to create streams of income. And, you know, everybody had to kind of reinvent. And in a way it created another level of resilience in a certain way, because, you know, you had to kind of rebound from all of that and we all did and so yeah it's kind of, of kind of intriguing talk a little bit about um the services that are provided through that process fit vegan coaching i know that you do things with individuals you do things online and you even have a community connection where you're trying to help people support their success in the environment in which they live so talk a little bit about that because i think that's important for people to know 
Yeah, absolutely. So there's obviously there's the online community, which can be accessible through podcasts, a free Facebook group, kind of my social media platforms, where I'm always trying to provide some value, education, give away some recipes, some tips on how to work out, how to stay motivated. And then in the actual program, we just stepped it up a notch in the past few months. But ultimately, now when people come in, they get their blood work done. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with who Dr. Lori Marbus is. I know, I know of her. I don't, I don't, I don't know her personally though. Okay, so she well, she came on board for for our team. So now we do the blood work for members when they first come into the program. They do a consultation with her, and then we start building a custom meal plan based off the blood work results. I see. Um, so if there's any deficiencies, we're going to make sure to address those through nutrition because we have a holistic nutritionist on the team. We're going to build them a custom workout plan to address the goals that they have and obviously meet them where they're at fitness wise. Right. You know, we have people that are training for Ironman and that just wants to build a little bit more muscle. And we have people that never worked out in their life and they're working out at home. They don't want to go to a gym. So there's a wide range of people that we coach. So we just meet people where they're at. And then we're adding the services where the food is included in your transformation. So we'll be able to ship whole food, plant-based, oil-free meals to your house. Um, that's going to be in accordance with your custom meal plan, which is based off the blood work as well. And then we just have an incredible community of people that are looking to get fitter, get healthier, very supportive, very inspiring. We have a lot of cancer survivors in the program that are there because they don't want any chances of reoccurrence. And they understand that eating whole food plant-based is the best way to do that. And they're looking to lose some weight at the same time. So when you have someone that's recovering from, you know, cancer and is reducing their risk and you have someone that's healthy, that's like, I don't want to work out. And then someone that's recovering from cancer is like, I'm going to go and do my workout. It kind of makes you feel a little bit terrible. You're like, I need to go and work out. I have no excuses to, to do oh, this right, now. Right, right. How do you link those people with the community? How is that connection made? Uh, so we have our own app. So everything okay. takes place on the app. There's also a desktop version as well for people to use. So whichever one they, they prefer uh, and everything syncs together. So there's a group chat on there. There's the ability to text our Fit Vegan coaches one-on-one -on -one in the app. It's like a texting option within the I app. See. We have we have four group calls a week, one with our nutritionist, one's with our doctor of physical therapy, one's with our doctor, and one's more of like a Q&A call where everyone gets to ask questions and kind of connect together. Oh, you've um, got a real complex. That's amazing the way you set that up. I think it's fantastic. I'm here with Maxine Seguin, and we're going to just take a few moments to hear from our sponsor, the National Health Association. You're listening to the Health Science Podcast Show. I want to remind you to visit the National Health Association website, where you'll find incredible resources to support your healthy lifestyle, including plant-exclusive eating without added salt, oil, and sugar. Simply go to healthscience.org or nationalhealthassociation.org. Be sure to check out membership, which is only $35 per year for those living within the United States and $55 for those living outside the U.S. You'll be amazed at all the information and benefits you'll receive. As a member, you're kept up to date on the latest evidence-based tools for health promotion. You'll receive the incomparable quarterly magazine, Health Science, a beautiful 40-page advertising-free publication, mailed to your home or offices, loaded with articles, recipes, inspirational stories, and interviews with world leaders in the fields of personal health, plant-based nutrition, water-only fasting, animal rights, and environmental support. And you'll receive details about life-changing events, such as the extraordinary annual conference of the National Health Association and diverse opportunities for plant-exclusive NHA cruises and travel vacations to exotic destinations around the globe. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and now back to the show. Welcome back to the Health Science Podcast. I'm here with my special guest, Maxime Seguin, who's a uh, fitness uh, coach with uh, Vegan Fitness Coaching, a very special business that really is helping people transform their lives and health with plant-based nutrition and fitness. Um, yeah, let's talk about that because, you know, you're, I, I like that idea where you talk about meeting people where they are. And, and mm -hmm. you know, I've counseled people for 45 years. And uh, early on in my days, you know, you when you get turned on to something that's so powerful, 
you know, you want to, you want to preach it. You want to turn everybody onto it. You want to, you know, hit people over the head with it if you can. And yeah. I noticed early on that, you know, I was turning people off to something that could probably have provided them with so much value over time. If I just respected a little bit more about where they were, where they were and taught them where they were rather than where I thought they should be. And it mm -hmm. sounds to me like your philosophy encompasses a little bit of that. So when you have someone come into you uh, and you have them coming in at all different places on this evolutionary path, so to speak, yeah. how, how, do you, how do you handle that, that way of holding back to some degree on information you know that right in that moment could change so much, but they're not really ready for that dance yet? How do you deal with that? How do you integrate that in your work? Yeah. So for, for this is a great question. So for myself and our team of coaches, I've trained them on that. So they understand that all transformation is 80% psychology and 20% strategy. We have great strategies. We know they work. We've done it 650 plus times. No one can argue with me on that. But the 80% of psychology is like what you mentioned, if we give you a plan, but you're mentally not ready to stick to it, you're not in the right position, you won't stick to the plan and then nothing's going to change. Right. And so that's why we try to have conversations with people like, Hey, what's the area that you struggle the most with, right? There's only two variables. When you look at it, looking at transforming someone's body and someone health, it's exercise and nutrition. For the most part, a lot of people struggle with nutrition because there's more emotions attached to it versus exercise. Right. Uh, so in scenarios, it is exercise. So we want to help them. We'll look at their schedule and be like, Hey, where can we fit in some workout? How can we adjust things with you to make it fit within your, your day to day? If they tell us they have three days available, we'll do three days. If they say six days, we'll do six days, right? But we meet people where they're at. Some people want too much <laughs> at the start. Right. And on the flip side for nutrition is like, hey, what's showing up for you when you're trying to stick to the nutrition plan or where you're trying to eat these foods? Is it, there's rebellious dieters as I like to call them. They'll, they'll eat healthy, but if you tell them to eat healthy, they won't want to eat healthy because they'll rebel against what you're saying. Some people struggle with structure. Some people just want to have the freedom to kind of choose whatever it is that they want to eat, which led them to be in the position they were in before. So limiting belief, self-sabotage, value system, we address all of that in some of the initial conversations. We can have a better understanding of where they're at, what's the thing that is put, that's in their way to be able to move forward ultimately. Well, I want to talk about all of those pieces because I spent a lot of time in really working with transformation and change and belief and all of that. So I want to get there. But mm -hmm. what I'm hearing then is, do you have people that are in the program who are not ready to even be plant-based or is that the bottom line? <clears throat> they have to be. Uh, so we opened it up a, a year ago to people that want to transition to eating 100% plant-based or simply eat more plant-based. Um, I, I didn't share this earlier, but when my, my ex fiance passed away, I set a mission and a goal for myself, which is to help 10,000 people get lean, thrive and disease proof their bodies on plants by 2033 and okay. a million by 2050. And so reverting back to that, I was like, if I only work with vegans, I don't need vegans to be more vegan. I need more people to eat more plant-based. Right. And so we opened up the program to people that want to transition or that just even want to eat 70, 80% more plant-based because a huge difference on their health. There's such a controversy really even in plant-based world and, and, and vegan consciousness where, you know, you've got so many of these very refined processed vegan products that yeah. take the place of what people were used to before. Are you okay with embracing some of that in that transition for people? So they eat a faux chicken or they eat some fake cheese or they do what they need to, as long as they're coming into the fold of being more plant centered. Is that somehow that you, you focus on that? You think about that that way? Uh, no, okay. everything we do is 100% whole food plan based. Okay. Because to me, if we're going to, if we're going to show you how to eat properly, whatever we teach you at first is what's going to stick the hardest. And so if we give you fake meat and fake chicken, then you're going to build a reliance on it. You'll visually know how to structure a meal with that amount of protein. And right. so we just teach our members like, hey, here's how you hit your amount of protein and the right nutrition that you need the whole food plan based way. If you want a Beyond Burger or some fake chicken from time to time, that's a personal choice, right? Okay. Yeah. Well, you don't turn, you're not turned off. You don't turn people off who do that is what I'm asking you. You'll, oh, still, no, you'll, no, still, em you'll still embrace their choice, even if you don't completely and fully agree with it. 
if they're Absolutely. coming. See, to me, I'm at a point myself where, of, of course, I've dealt with disease patterns for so long. And yeah. I know that whole food plant based is the only way to go. I mean, I know this in my heart, in my soul, in my practice and everything in my life. I've done this over 45 years in my yeah. own life. But the fact of the matter is, in all the years of counseling people, I've yet to find anybody who loves deprivation. So yeah. when you try to take something away from someone, there's always that little part of their brain that wants to do it and then really kind of wants to do it in your face. And so yeah. sometimes having that adjustment where, all right, and you, you want a pizza and you're putting some soy cheese on it and you're having a pizza in that moment. But the educational part is that's not what we're recommending we're understanding yeah. that in your transition, you may feel the need to do that, but this is where we want you to target. Um, yeah. Do you do any of that kind of education and how you counsel people? Does that come into play at all? Yeah, absolutely. So just okay. to kind of clarify, so the meal plans that we build, we don't have, we haven't created recipes with fake vegan products in them. So right. everything that we give to members are whole food plan based. And then if they have a social event, a date night or whatever, then we'll be like, hey, you can use some of these foods if you wish to, but here's how to make it fit within the metrics that you're supposed to have to accomplish a transformation that you want. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like, you know, from time to time, I'll have some as well when I'm eating out with my with my fiance or whatever it may be. Um, and so, yeah, it's hard to get away from it at right. all times. Yeah. And you, you, uh, you know, you count, you counsel. I'm assuming some elite athletes also. Is that true? You've worked with some of these people? Yeah, we've worked with a few elite athletes, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, one of the beautiful parts of all of this that comes out of this plant-based world is that we know that the factors that create damage are basically come down to two things. There's chronic inflammation and there's oxidative stress. Mm -hmm. And this way of living and eating solves both of those things. So yeah. in that process, it improves what I've always addressed as responsibility, our ability to respond to change, resilience. And then, of course, what's the primary goal of all people doing athletic events is performance. And yeah. performance comes down to two things, rapid recovery, the ability to recover and the ability to perform. So yeah. in, in your experience, do you reinforce that outcome? Is that what you've seen as you've really counseled all you've gone through over 600 people? Do you see those changes in bounce back ability, resilience, performance? Talk a little bit about that if you can from your experience and some of the case people that you've worked with. Yeah, absolutely. We work with a lot. I have a huge background in Ironman, triathlon, endurance, I saw that. kind of all that. So a lot of the people that are attracted to me are some of that background as well. So competing in Ironman triathlon or some endurance races. Uh, and they understand, as I understand through competing, that the name of the game is about recovery. It's not about the one that can train, you know, all the time if you're always tired and not being able to push every workout session. So one that recovers the fastest. And so it's about putting everything on your side that you can. So obviously eating whole food plant-based, like you mentioned, one of the best ways to reduce chronic inflammation is coming in from, from the training and from the exercise. We also put a massive emphasis on sleep and tracking people's sleep to see how they're performing, how their body is being stressed from the exercise, how it's affecting their recovery. We use like a, a WHOOP tracker. There's one of my, my go-tos. We're able to measure their, their HRV, their resting heart rate, their body temperature, and see how the training and the nutrition is affecting their body and then make adjustments from there as they're, as they're moving along. But we've seen people increase, you know, they're, they're, they're decreased their running speed by one minute per kilometer. I know it's in miles here in, in the United States, but I'm from Canada originally. So reducing by one minute uh, per kilometer per, uh, for their racing, improve their swimming time, improve their cycling time, increase their cycling output. And obviously because they're lighter and they're pushing out more power, they perform a lot better. So yeah, it, makes the, it makes the world of a difference once you're transitioning and obviously putting the emphasis on sleep. Maxine, does your program collect that data? Are you saving that? Are you doing anything with the data that you've just ex described? Yeah, so the data from Whoop is to Whoop on their own account. So we don't collect that data ourselves. Yeah. Um, it's with Whoop personally, but we have access to the member's account so we can see how their sleep is performing, how their body is responding. Yeah, the sleep is a huge piece because, you know, uh, sleep deficiency is one of the biggest causes of weight gain. And, and, and part of that is the disturbance of deep delta wave sleep, which is also where most of even the additional growth hormone is produced in even adults. And so, you know, in the work that I've done, many times people feel, and this is a great point you made, that when they're working out and they're not getting the results they would like to have, 
many times they feel they just need to work out harder and harder instead of understanding that the recovery phase, that rest phase, that sleep phase is mm -hmm. where the real value often comes in producing the kind of growth response that you want after you've taxed and challenged those muscles in that kind of workout. So uh, yeah. you, you hammer that home with people, I'm assuming, where you're really working with that sleep component, as you said. Yeah, absolutely. We're, a lot of our members are type A perfectionist overachievers that think that more is better and they have a full plate plus another side dish that's full. Uh, so we we are used to scaling people back. I'll be like, hey, we, we can do less exercise. We can eat more food. We can rest some more. And ultimately, they get a better transformation by doing that because their body is in optimal state to be able to lose the fat. They're not right. super high cortisol, stressed all the time. Right. Their body is able to better transform. I'm here with uh, Maxime Seguin. And uh, Maxime, where can people uh, find you, follow you, learn more about the stuff that you're doing? Where's the site that they can go to for that? Yeah, fitvegancoaching.com. Um, at the top menu, there's our podcast, YouTube, Instagram, all the cool platforms on top there. Yeah, so that's all beautiful. Um, yeah, so when we talk about uh, the the workout programs, I mean, you're tailoring these workouts to what these people are trying to achieve, whether they're bodybuilders or just people that want to improve performance in their yeah. cardiovascular health. So you do all of those kinds of things. And you have, uh, I, I'm assuming that when you deal with bodybuilders, that's a unique population of people because they go through, um, they go through events where they've got to go from being like incredibly cut to where they're not. And then they go back and forth. And so that's kind of an intriguing dance. That must be a challenge, uh, to really adjust how you work with that population of people, because it's such a unique world that they function in. Talk a little bit about that. Cause I know the whole vegan bodybuilding movement is such a remarkable movement. Robert's been involved. Jeff Palmer has been involved. I know yeah. a number of these people. So talk about how you approach that process of vegan bodybuilding and the work that you do. Yeah, of course. So the amount of bodybuilders that we work with is very minimal. The majority of people that we work with are 45 to 75 working their regular jobs wanting to lose some weight you know struggling to like lose it and keep it off but for some of the bodybuilders that we have worked with throughout the years we do more of the muscle building and the fat loss phase up to the point where they need to get stage ready when they go to get stage ready i refer them to someone else because on a personal level i don't think that it's that healthy to get to that low body fat or percentage i've done it myself and i never want to go back there right and so i pass it off to someone that's a little bit more has more experience in being able to bring people to that lower body fat percentage. Right. I bring people to healthy body fat percentage where they feel lean, they feel healthy, they feel fit. Uh, and anything past that, if they really want to compete and step on stage, then I pass them off to uh, someone I know. Well, I've always told people fitness and athletic performance are not the same things because athletes, as you well know, they they want to get the highest level of performance regardless of how much damage it may create to their bodies and their beings. And so that's where their concern is, where you and I certainly are looking at fitness and health as an yeah. outcome that will involve better performance, but while taking into account the integrity of the body and its well-being. So yeah. that, that's a whole different mentality that that yeah. you're that you're really kind of addressing your time with uh it, one of the biggest measures of stress and you brought it up is heart rate variability do you see really good changes with this and the work you're doing yeah we've seen a lot of our members increase their heart rate variability as they kind of lose the weight start eating more plant-based start prioritizing their sleep a lot more um so yeah we've definitely seen the data go up on those numbers and then their resting heart rate go down that's uh, very significant because that's really typically in the stress field, probably single-handedly the most important measure of stress, really heart rate variability, which is intriguing. Um, I know when you're doing fitness work, you know, there's always a, a kind of a, a three-pronged approach. You've got cardiovascular, you've got strength training, and then you've got flexibility and balance. Mm -hmm. How do you integrate uh, systems of care, systems of work and movement that are very ancient systems like yoga, Tai Chi, Qigong, which are really very powerful for flexibility and balance. Do you integrate any of those things in the work and counseling that you do? Yeah, so we do have some mobility workouts for people to do in stretches, for people to do post-workout. Um, and obviously when you're doing the cardiovascular exercise as well, there's a warm up, there's a cool down to make sure their body's prepared, obviously reduce the amount of stress, reduce the risk of injury while they're exercising. And then the strength training will be tailored to home gym wherever they're at whatever equipment they have access to but yeah we do prioritize the cardiovascular because 
like I tell people, like you can have big biceps and a flat stomach and look great, but if your heart gives out, you still die, right? right? So it's important to be able to exercise it. So we always like to include some base of cardiovascular exercise. And in moving forward, we use it as a tool to create deficit, to continue to improve the body composition alongside it. the nutrition. Do you recommend within that some of the short burst activity or high intensity interval training, any of that kind of stuff in the cardiovascular, or you just want to get them to move first? Get them to move first, right? Yeah. Zone two cardio, if you've heard it, you probably sure you heard of that before. So zone two cardio is kind of what we focus on for the most part. Um, slow, steady state, uh, a lot less stress on the body. You're a lot less hungry once you're done doing it as well, especially since you're in a fat loss phase. So yeah, zone two is kind of what we go to for cardio. I noticed that in your work that you've also mentioned that you have other businesses that are grounded in veganism that are involved in health and wellness. What other kind of things that have you set in motion as an entrepreneur? What do you have? Yeah, I have five other vegan coaching practices. Okay, but they so, all center around coaching. Yeah, all center around coaching. So one thing I realized with this big mission of wanting to impact 10,000 people and a million people, I was like, I could just make it about me and trying to get me to impact 10,000 people. But that's selfish. And secondly, some people are going to look at me as vegans and be like, he's too skinny for me. Or he speaks funny. And I don't connect with him. And that's okay, right? We can't please everyone. So what I decided to do is find other people that have a similar passion as me, but that potentially don't have my background in businesses, my skill in building systems right. and scaling businesses. I'm like, hey, let me come in. You can be the face of this company. Let me build your system. Let me help you scale it so we can have more impact. And ultimately, if I have, you know, 10 companies that are impacting 100 people, that's 1,000 people right there that we just impacted that wouldn't have worked with me because one of them is a really buff vegan. The other one is a full-on Ironman. The other one does calisthenics. Right. And so by having different faces to the movement, people are able to go with whoever they connect the most. And then I'm still able to have the impact that I want to have. You know, when people are making change, let's talk about the process of transformation because this is kind of an interesting piece. This is really what your work is centered around. You're sharing information that is helping people establish a new set of beliefs and behaviors that mm -hmm. leads to new experiences that now can be etched and woven into their behavioral tapestry of the brain and nervous system. This is a very yeah. powerful process. Yeah. And, and I always liken this, the analogy of a, a goldfish in a bowl. You know, when a goldfish is in a bowl, the entire world of that goldfish is that bowl. But we stand outside and we know the world of possibilities that are out here. So mm -hmm. each of us is really confined by the goldfish bowl of our own beliefs and experience. And so oftentimes those beliefs lead to behaviors that then lead to experiences that are kind of like confirmation bias. They mm -hmm. kind of led us to experience only what reinforces our beliefs. So we're never able to break out of that goldfish bowl. So yeah. in, the, in the work that you do, when we talk about that process, how do we help people? How do you really help people understand that what they believe is only a small part of what is and that they have this uh, incredible ability to, in a sense, establish new behaviors from new beliefs that will yeah. now lead to these incredible experiences of transformation and health. Talk yeah. to me how you deal with that, because that brings into play, you know, who's really coachable, who isn't, who's really open to the coachable message, who's really yeah. open to, am I going to really be able to accept a different belief framework that can lead me somewhere else? Can we talk about that just a little bit? I think that's an important piece. Yeah, absolutely. And like, I mean, that's something we put a huge emphasis on. We're, we're really good at, and it's really fast for us to create a workout plan and nutrition plan. That doesn't take a lot of time. What we spend our time on the majority of the time is, is mindset and psychology. So ultimately we talked about the old self and the new self and kind of wanting to build that new identity and the detachment from the old self, which is really hard and ingraining it into your, your nervous system. So when we let the community do the initial part, so obviously I'm online leading by example, doing these cool, all these cool things and being a vegan, being whole food plant-based. That's only a part of showing them what's possible. But once they get into the community, they can see other people that are similar to them, similar background, similar lifestyle, three kids working a full-time job, accomplishing amazing things. And then they start to believe that it's possible for them. And then when they start to make progression, we've trained our coaches to reinforce the behavior that we want more of. That way there's a conditioning, there's a celebration. So if I, you know, Frank, if we, you were one of our members and you had a hard time with discipline, 
And then on your check-in, you did your workout. And you're like, it's an awesome, awesome job, Frank. You did a good job on your discipline this week. You're a lot more disciplined. I would plug that word in a lot more every time I had a conversation with you. And eventually, like I keep hearing it, maybe I am disciplined, right? Maybe I can have more discipline. And then it starts to be conditioned in your nervous system and ultimately starts to become embedded into your identity. And then it becomes who you are. That's just simply right. who you are. And it's the right. same as, you know, smokers. If I go to offer a cigarette to someone that doesn't smoke, that's not a part of the identity. They'll say no in a heartbeat, right? Versus someone that does smoke to part of the identity, they're going to say yes. The whole point is to make, to condition these things into people's body to that extent so that it's easy for them to be disciplined. It's easy right. for them to make the right decision. You know, the, 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 the difficult part of this on some level, and, and it's the thing we all overcome is that, you know, we've been brought up with a medical system that has literally disengaged us from our own personal power from the mm -hmm. ability to heal. So we, we look to voices of authority and treatments and interventions that we feel we must rely on to be able to express the high level performance and health that you and I are speaking about. So people yeah. become a diabetic. They have their, they become a heart disease patient. They in a sense have sacrificed their autonomy to an identity that has been imposed upon them. And in that imposition, uh, there's an attachment. And I know you've talked about self-sabotage where someone almost doesn't feel they have a right to be free. They have a right to be uh, operating yeah. at this high level of performance and function because, you know, take the obese person. That's been kind of a protective barrier in a way. Now you yeah. take that away and all of a sudden they're viewed in the world in a different way. And they sometimes even can't handle the positive accolades and input. It can be overwhelming. So how yeah. do you address, how do you address that? that self-sabotage or that identity process that has really sold people short, that has really made them feel that they don't have a right to be well and to be happy and to be healthy and to be transformed and to perform at this incredibly high level. How do you address that and work with that? Yeah, in a very simple way, just bombarding them with love and support. Because okay. at the end of the day, a lot of people take on these journeys alone and they start to lose weight on their own. They start to feel good, but they have no one else around them to kind of reinforce this new identity that they have. And it feels a little bit lonely and they start to question themselves and there's no one there to confirm the new belief that they're trying to build. And so then they revert back to their old self. I just recorded a video on this. It's the the Venom Spider-Man scene, right? When Spider-Man right. is trying to get out of Venom and the black gunk is attached to him and is trying to right. pull him back into the old self. That's exactly what's going to happen. Your body, your soul is going to put up a fight to step into that new identity. And the old self is going to put up a fight to pull you back in. And the thing that allows you to step into that new identity is repetition, but it's really hard to have repetition when it's just you, but when you have a community and a coach and someone that's holding you accountable, that's there to support you and condition you with the positive words, then it's so much easier to continue to have the repetition. And then over time you step into the new self. Yeah. It's, you know, it's interesting because I've always said this, you know, when people make that kind of change with repetition, you start facilitating pathways in that brain and nervous system, you're opening up new lines of communication that now become and replace these old patterns of behavior. But over yeah. time, there's still that old voice that wants to pull you back. But as you make that change, you actually get to a place. I haven't found this. I, I found this in anybody I've ever worked with where you get to a place where when you look back, you have a hard time believing that that's where you once were because you yeah. made that shift. But you made a very good point at the very beginning of this that there is an aha moment when you make these changes where the mm -hmm. very pain and discomfort that you felt was something that was a part of you no longer is. And you're stuck with that aha moment of, wow, I can breathe. I mm -hmm. can feel, I don't have that pain anymore. I don't. So there is an aha moment of that that is very transformative if you allow yourself to be open and conscious of it. So that's, yeah. that's an amazing process in itself. That, that yeah. idea that, wow, we, we see that, manifestation of that wellness with even small changes in our lives. Yeah. And it's about, I also believe that you can create those moments, right? So you always refer to the, to the heart attack moment at a cancer diagnosis where people right. are like, oh, I need to change my life because I got this bad news. You know, unfortunately I'll talk to certain people that have 40 pounds to lose. I'm like, I'm not ready. And then they, a year goes by and they come back, they're 80 pounds overweight now. And they're like, now I need to do something. I was like, is that what was needed for you to put on an additional 40 pounds to be in pain enough that you wanted to create some change? And ultimately that's what it takes for certain people. Um, but there's a process called the Dickens process. Have you heard of it before? Yeah, go over with the guest. Tell, tell our audience all about it. Yes. 
Yes. So it's, I'm a big fan of Tony Robbins. It just was at his, uh, his event in Florida a few weeks ago. But the Dickens process basically is where you grab a current belief system that you have that you would like to change. And then you go, you, you close your eyes, you go into a state of gratefulness. And then we explore like, hey, if we were to continue down this path with this current belief system, what would your life look like in five years from now? What would it feel like in your body? What would your relationship be like? What would your health be like? What would your life be like? What would your career be like? And you just kind of explore you kind of explore all these different feelings and emotions in your body and you might you fast forward to 10 years 15 years 20 years and at that point you come back like hey this was only a glimpse of how painful it's actually going to be in the future now what would you like to replace this belief system with you have a new belief system and then you do the same exercise how great would your life be in five years from now how would your relationship your health your body your career your finances be and you kind of explore that process so it's a way to self-create pain and so pull step back from the old identity and then so we to create some appeal to move towards a new identity. Yeah. And, and it's, an, and it's a, a great process and it's great work. And the other thing that I think, and, and you talked about the gratefulness and how you model this, there's also that piece too, that people need to know that, um, you know, we talk a lot about forgiveness in the work that we do in our relationships and in our lives and I've always said to people that, you know what, the evidence is very strong that I'm always shocked how you can take someone that has a health problem that has taken years to develop, maybe cancer, mm -hmm. joint change or whatever. And by making some very constructive changes within weeks to months, short periods of time, we see a dramatic revolution in the outcome of their wellness. It's almost yeah. as if there is a biological process of forgiveness built into the body. And I think when people understand that they need to approach the forgiveness within themselves as much yeah. as they do within the relationships around them and to realize the power and how the body manifests that forgiveness to heal some of the mm -hmm. most devastating things we've created, that's a transformative process in itself. And it's tied into the very things that you're talking about. Yeah, no, it brought up a really good point here. Doing the internal work is the most powerful thing you can do because I said the majority of, of society focuses on doing the external work. They right. think that if they make more money, that if they do more exercises, that if they right. get the nicer car or whatever it may be, that it's going to solve all the problems. But ultimately, the problem will show up with a different face. Versus if you do the internal work, it's magical how things in the external world start to fall into place. And you're like, oh, I don't have to worry about this anymore. I'm not stressed about this anymore. Oh, this is such a great area of my life that's improved. So the internal work is going to set everything in place in the external world. If you just focus on the external world, the internal world is going to stay the same until you deal with it, unfortunately, because it's pretty hard to, it's harder to go inwards than it is to do an Ironman. Yeah, that's the truth. And a lot of people, and, and we, and the sadder part about that, that makes it even more difficult is we live in a culture where we're constantly being pulled outside of ourselves the information yeah. that we're glutted with around us. So there's this feeling like we have to attach to all of that external, what we'll call dissonance and noise, just noise and chatter. Yeah. When you go inside, you have that respite where it actually can be a sanctuary when you allow yourself to be open to it, where you really find that what Virginia Satir used to call that treasure that's called by your name, that deep divine mm -hmm. space within each of us. So that is the harder work and it's the work that, and we see this, for example, we do a lot of fasting from the NHA. One of yeah. the hardest parts of fasting is spending that internal time with yourself. People get so antsy because now they have this introspective part of the journey that's so much a part of that dance. And it's really hard for them because we're not used to that. And so when you turn people onto that and this younger generation of people, I really feel a lot of the anxiety that we see is that they've been disengaged from really doing that internal work or taking that inward journey. As we, wind, as we wind this down, uh, is there any advice you'd like to give or final words you'd like to share with our audience out here, Maxine? Yeah, I would say two things. Whatever you think is worth it isn't, right? The thing that's preventing you from moving forward with improving your health and your physical body, whatever you think is worth it isn't. Because once you get sick, you would give anything away to be able to get that back R regardless of the job the career the car the clothes whatever it is that, that's preventing you right now or people's comment about continuing to eat meat once you get sick you would you go vegan in a heartbeat to trying to make yourself feel better and then the second one is i think we're a society that's stuck on perfection 
like we we there's a fear of failure and there's a, there's an aspect of us that wants to do everything perfectly the first time the biggest piece of advice i was given by one of my mentors many years ago that changed my life was taking perfect action he's like if you just do that repeatedly you're going to improve and you're going to go somewhere and here here we are now several years later so take imperfect action and know that whatever you think is worth it isn't and you should probably focus on your health i really want to thank my very special guest maxime seguin today for really sharing his wisdom his insight the incredible work he's doing helping people marriage that plant-based nutrition with really high level fitness to improve body and mind and their well-being and transforming their life and health and i urge you to follow maxime the uh his location fitvegancoaching.com uh, is in the show notes. Please follow him and, and do what you can to learn more and more about what he's doing and how you can integrate that into your life. And I really want to thank our uh, audience out there today because without you, we couldn't do what we do. And I want to really thank you for being part of this active and healthy community. On behalf of the NHA, I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode or being with you on the next episode of the Health Science Podcast. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association. Thank you for joining us today and for your commitment to evidence-based health science that backs a whole food plant-exclusive lifestyle and contributes to the well-being of all people, animals, and our environment. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino. Be sure to leave a rating and a review, and we'll see you on the next show.